Hi there, uh, who just joined? I agree. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. We'll wait for a couple more minutes until all of the fellows join in and we will start with the session. We'll start with uh, Swarna you. You have to share your screen and okay. that will go on for 20 minutes. Uh, the time given is 20 minutes. After that, I will take on uh, the screen. Um, I will give a presentation and we will end the today's uh, uh, meeting with uh, Karthik's presentation. Uh, each of us will okay. be given uh, 20 minutes. Hi everyone, um, we'll start the meeting, we'll wait uh, for a few more minutes and then we will uh, start.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Open EBS Weekly Contributors uh, Meeting. Today is 20th of April 2018. And uh, we have a couple of topics in our agenda. We'll start off with uh, Swarna giving a talk on uh, using Open EBS on OpenSift. And then there'll be a talk on uh, about end-to-end uh, -end testing, E2E, the journey towards it. Finally, we will have uh, a short uh, discussion regarding Litmus, the newly open source project. All right. <clears throat> Swarna, uh, you can uh, go ahead. Uh, we are able to see your screen. You can start uh, in, in the presentation mode. Um, okay. Thanks. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Swarna here. I'm going to explain about how to deploy an application using Open EBS and OpenShift, and what are all the prerequisites that we have to follow before deploying Open EBS and the applications. Before going to deploy, we all should know about what is OpenShift and why OpenShift and how to install it. OpenShift is an open source container application platform from Red Hat that automates the provisioning, management, and scaling of applications, which is built on Kubernetes and Docker. Why OpenShift? OpenShift to be a secure, op secure container application platform, which will provide some security context that can control the access, um, I mean the actions, which a pod can perform. And a concept called project in OpenShift is, project is nothing but a, Kubernetes namespace, which will allow users to organize their data and manage manage their data. And also it will ensure, ensure the users to access and see only what they are allowed to. In case of Kubernetes, there is no security context. There, there is no security context in namespaces. If you are a user in Kubernetes, then you can able to see all the different namespaces and resources that defined on them. And coming to installation part, please refer this document. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are able to see. Go inside the docs.openavs.io and follow the OpenShift installation document. I have followed this document to install two nodes OpenShift cluster. Time. Now I'm going to demonstrate on these topics. One is configure access permissions. OpenShift as a secure container application platform, it will by default it will not allow other containers to run on OpenShift. In order to provide access to the host volumes, which is needed needed for OpenEBS volume replicas to run, we are configuring the access permissions in the security context. And I'm going to demo on deploy OpenEBS and Parcona application through OpenShift CLI and through OpenShift Web Console. Coming to configure access permissions, edit the restricted OC edit re, uh, SSC restricted in that allow host DIR volume plugin to true. This is to allow parts to use host DIR to mount and run as user. User type, make sure that user type as run as any. This allow parts to run with root user. And also make sure that Selinux is, AC Linux is permissive. This is also one of the security context in OpenShift, which should be disabled to allow other parts to run. If we miss this step, replicas will fail to deploy. It will go to crash loop backup state. I will show you how to modify the security context. And when you when you install OpenShift cluster, it will ask you to create an admin user with 
cluster admin permissions using this command and provide the password for that admin using using this command and log into the and log into the admin user to deploy open ebs and the application once you log into the admin you will be able to see the output like this here the project is nothing but a kubernetes namespace by default admin will use default default project and check whether the nodes are ready by running the command oc get node and check the pods are running those are related to open shift and deploy the open ebs operator and the storage classes directly from the, from using the url or clone the open ebs repo and execute the files using the local copy i have cloned I have cloned open ebs repo in my um, cluster go inside the open ebs kates folder apply the operator by using oc apply operator yaml now check the service account deployment and services are created or not by running the command oc oc get svc my api server is created and check the tip in the pvc check whether the pods are running or not here the my api server and open abs provisioner are running now go inside the demo folder if you want to deploy any application go inside the demo folder now i am going to deploy parkona application before doing that apply the storage classes create the storage classes by applying open ebs storage classes yaml and check whether storage classes are created or not by running the command or to get sc storage classes are created now now go and deploy an application which you want to deploy now i am going to deploy parkona application like this yaml demo parkona mysql pvc yaml Persistent volume client is created. Check the PVC by running also get PVC. PVC is created and check the pods are running or not. First check the service. Service is created and check the pods whether are running or not. It is in container creating state. which will take few minutes hi uh, swarna this is amit i i have got a question yes sir um the the first step uh, that you uh, you know uh, ran through uh it was like uh, setting some permissions right some access permissions is it possible okay. to run those steps using kubectl um i know i mean okay um thanks meanwhile i will explain how to de how to deploy application through openshift web console before going to deploy application through web console get the ip address of the master master get the ip address of the master and the default port using the url login to the 
open shift web console by providing the admin credi credentials these credentials you will be create during installation process once you log into the web console you will be able to see the screen like this here you can able to see the project here project is nothing but kubernetes namespace we have set by default the admin user will select default so click on default then if you want to import if you want to deploy any application import the json template of that application here we have couple of json templates which i am going to import it once you import you will be able to see the screen like this click on create and update the template and click continue here you can see the properties of the open ebs redis redis application and here make sure that open ebs storage class is open ebs standard then click on create once you click on create you can able to see the message open ebs redis has been created or not now i will show you the demo Use the controller IP and the port. And provide provide the username and password. This user you will create during installation process to deploy Open EBS. Here. have have set by default admin selects default project click on default and here if you want to use some other project you can switch between the project okay. click on add to project click import yaml or json download the json file from the open ebs repo or copy the link or copy the file and paste it here i have downloaded it already browse it and open it click on create update the template template here you can able to see the all the properties of the redis application namespace database service name and the password volume capacity storage class here we have to make sure that storage class is open abs standard click on create has been created now click on close and under application you can check the deployment ready is created and it is running and check the pod pods are created controller and replica one and replica two check the services services and even here also you can check how to get pod perkona is running ready is creating
it will take time to create hello sona mm. vishnu here Uh, quick question: What is the version of uh, uh, KKTS that is installed on this uh, uh, OpenShift? Three dot seven. Uh, okay, not the OpenShift. OpenShift uh, open uh, version. Not not OpenShift version. I'm looking for the uh, Kubernetes version. We are not using Kubernetes. Version. So internally, it will be using right? Yes, sir. One dot seven. It's one dot seven dot five. One dot seven dot five. Okay. Cool. Hey, Swarna Amit here. Hey, Sam. Uh, uh, with regards to the version, is it mentioned in the docs somewhere that this is a version that will be used? Yes, sir. It is mentioned in the document. Okay. Thanks. So now we are on time uh, for the second uh, presentation. Uh, maybe we, you can actually complete the rest of the slides. Uh, okay. Next step is if the user wants to delete the application which he deployed through OpenShift Web Console, we have to follow some instructions. For that, we have to delete using OC delete all hyphen l and app here you can able to see this open ebs ready for system use the tab name and delete the pvcs get the output of the pvc and delete it oc get oc delete and the pvc name then it is in creating state so it is in an error Follow OC delete all hyphen l app app name and OC delete Redis and delete the secret of the Redis database using OC secret OC delete secret secret name secret name is here Redis. That's it. Amit. Okay. Thanks, uh, Swarna. Um, so uh, maybe you can uh, stop sharing the screen so that we can let the the next presenter uh, to present um, thanks a lot thanks thanks everyone
fine uh, i i shall be starting the uh, share my screen all right so in this presentation we'll be talking about uh, the journey of open ebs uh, with respect to end to end testing we will be discussing on on the observations uh, open ebs uh, and all of us had with respect to end to end uh, we will see what are the factors that were missing in uh, end to end and what did we do to solve them and finally uh, we'll be introducing the project called uh, litmus which is again the topic for the next discussion that Karthik will be starting all right so here are the few observations uh, we could see uh, an individual or a team with a role of uh, with a developer role a developer mindset uh, trying to uh, use e2e uh, with respect to the tools uh, the individual had um, uh, mostly uh, the individual will be preferring uh, to use cube cuttle uh, mini cube or to some extent helm and uh, try to see if that particular feature that uh, the individual got implemented can be tested for you know a success or a failure right and then um, um, the individual would go on to uh, post those uh, specifications uh, to some github or some documentation and when confronted with the same question about e2e to another developer or at, let's say uh, another uh, role right <clears throat> uh, that the things were different that the toolings changed, the perceptions are uh, changed, the intent uh, and the expectations from the E2E changed, right? Um, it changed from just being a mini cube uh, or a helm to uh, to some of the new tools like Jenkins, uh, Ansible's, and all. The expectations changed as well. Uh, can it run for a week or so, uh, and um, uh, will it be able to give me results after the week? Um, there were many more observations that we found with respect to e2e uh, uh, the expectations from the e2e uh, it it, um, it varied widely uh, it it starts with uh, a basic pass or fail uh, to see the progress in a given sprint uh, to uh, to the ability to run it across platforms clouds on premise bare metal and so on right so then uh did it work um what we saw what what we observed just now uh were different teams trying to build up uh, their uh, specifications trying to build up some scripts for e2e and um, obviously those scripts were run uh, before the uh, pr got merged uh, or the check-in got merged into the main branch um, everything uh, seems great but uh, did it work well, unfortunately, it, it did not uh, work out as expected. Uh, the reason being, uh, OpenEBS uh, had some uh, <clears throat> uh, scenarios, some cases where the end users were not able to run the product. There were some failures, uh, some exceptions um, that uh, all these uh, E2Es had uh, missed. Right. So the next question that comes to uh, that did come uh, to our mind was, what exactly did we uh, miss? Right. Uh, all right. And this is uh, uh, what uh, we had uh, missed. Um, so the end-to-end -end journey on OpenEBS uh, uh, missed out the inputs from the its end users. Uh, when I say end users, uh, I mean uh, the inputs from end users uh, to contribute to our Z2E. How about end users uh, uh, enabling end users to contribute to the end-to-end -end specifications? Uh, that would be great, right? Because the end users are the ones who will be running the product uh, in their specific environments. Okay, so this was the final thesis that we uh, came out of uh, based on the observations uh, and the facts, the misses and all those things. Um, uh, the 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 item number one um, was enabling the end users to contribute and the second was second one was finding some kind of a tooling or, or a platform or a library uh, that um, 
that uh, helps uh, uh, various teams to uh, implement the end-to-end -end test cases, uh, which would be lightweight, uh, yet uh, very effective, right? So, uh, so the search uh, began, uh, <coughs> we, we uh, looked out for various uh, libraries and, and, and various frameworks, and uh, we did, did come across a lot of them. And at one point, uh, we thought uh, YAML-based specifications were great to have, uh, but then it was quickly discarded by uh, the end users when we saw that the end users were really uh, uh, were not able to understand or were not able to um, implement their own uh, ideas into the into the you know uh, the YAMLs, which were really very. Um, uh, tightly syntaxed, it, it, it had its scope, it had its limitations, it, it, it uh, meant, it was meant to be used in a particular way, right, which was not native, of course, right. Um, and then um, that was like one aspect uh, uh, where uh, we thought YAML to be good, but it failed uh, as a as medium of end to end. And uh, the then uh, we try to find out more and then we came across uh, with one such tool uh, which uh, we at OpenEBS found it to be awesome uh, uh, what we saw is that that particular tool was able to help us help the end users frame the e2e specifications in their native language right all right so this is what we got uh, the one that I was talking just now about framing the specifications in the native language uh, is one of the BDD, you know, Cucumber based frameworks that's known as GoDog. This is from the Datadog family, from the Datadog community, right? And the other one, uh, of course, we know about kubectl, and the, but the question comes, why kubectl, right? What we saw is, what we observed is, kubectl is one of those tools used broadly across all the communities you know, in Kubernetes, all the tools in Kubernetes. Um, uh, and kubectl is not just a CLI, it's, it's a tool where one can use to uh, execute operations like put, post, get, how about patch, we got it all covered in kubectl. And um, when, when talked about kubectl from the point of display, uh, kubectl was uh, good enough to execute uh, Go templating. It can um, uh, display outputs in YAML, uh, JSON. It can customize the outputs. It, it does even have uh, the concept of plugins, right? Uh, with uh, again the Kubernetes coming up with custom resources, uh, the, the 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 scope of uh, kubectl broadened. We can use kubectl to manage the custom resources. Uh, that's where we thought um, kubectl as one of the tools that. OpenEBS should be using in its end-to-end -end, uh, implementation um, where the different roles of different individuals and you not uh, learn something new. They would have already been learning on kubectl because they are already on Kubernetes. So let's use the best one available in the Kubernetes, right? So uh, now what about the GoDog and kubectl? How do we uh, marry these two concepts together, right? Because kubectl understands YAML as well. Right, and we found out that YAML is not the one uh, which is effective when we talk about end users, when we talk about users who are really not interested in the code, but rather in the outcome, rather in the specifications, their use cases. That's where, uh, that's when we um, um, got up uh, into creating a library that is uh, preferred, I mean, that is known as litmus. It's, it's a litmus test. It fails or it pass. It will give you that uh, outcome. And is an open source library uh, that one can find in the OpenEBS uh, GitHub org, right? This is the library which tries to merge uh, these two varying concepts. One is uh, making use of the native language um, that is provided by GoDog, and the second one is making use of kubectl, right? So <clears throat> this is what I have uh, got till now. We'll be talking, we'll be discussing more about uh, Litmus in our next presentation uh, that Karthik uh, has, right? Um, any questions so far? Amit, uh, this uh, flow looks uh, much, much better. Um, it's yeah. great. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks, uh, Kiran. Um, all right, so we'll move on to the next um, presentation, which is again a continuation of this that is on about more about litmus and and uh, this present this is not just a presentation. The next one, uh, it's more about a debate and discussion we will be having with respect to litmus or the or the um, the overall goals of litmus, uh, the folder structures, uh, what how exactly a user will be finding it useful, right? Uh, how can it be lightweight yet solve a majority of the problems, uh, a majority of the situations that we find in end to end? Okay, over to you, Kartik. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible to everyone? Yes. Yes, Okay. Um, so, Amit just took us all through what is the uh, philosophy and thinking behind E2E uh, that we have developed. So, what we'll do as part of this discussion. Uh, this is more of a discussion <coughs> is um, how this particular um, thought process can translate into um, uh, github depository so there are two three aspects that um, uh, are contribute towards creating this repo um, so litmus is actually a combination of a test facilitators and the tests themselves the test facilitators are more about components that you would use in your E2E, more like test containers, load generators, logging utils, etc. The other part is the actual tests themselves. And again, these tests are going to be categorized into multiple subcategories. One is um, the uh, user-friendly E2E that is going to make use of Godog that um, any user is uh, can sort of um, uh, take a look at the examples already provided in the uh, E2E and create his own test requirements as the template, which we will internally convert into the Go code. So the end the end product of uh, what Amit has just been talking about. So we we just saw scenario. Uh, so that is actually going to get converted into a test container or you could call a test deployment spec, which is going to use that container. Um, so this is going to be agnostic uh, to the underlying storage. Uh, the user can choose to say that he wants a particular uh, scenario uh, that uses the OpenEBS storage, or he can say it uses uh, some other third party storage. This is one type of, or one category of tests uh, that will be contained within Litmus. The next category, of course, is going to be about the OpenEBS E2E itself. Um, just to clarify what I'm speaking about, uh, let me show you um, uh, the plan or the the current model of Litmus repo that we've envisaged. Um, you will have the README and the contributing documentation, um, which is going to specify the intent of uh, Litmus and how the repo is being structured and uh, some examples of how it can be used. Contributing is going to contain details about uh, how users can contribute into the E2E, both in developing the uh, workload, in developing the use cases themselves using the um, Godog template, and also, if interested, add to the OpenEBS E2E itself, which is going to be a consumer of the workloads as well as the Godog template. Uh, the broad uh, parent level directories in this repo are workloads, utils, and E2E. Workloads, in turn, um, are going to um, consist of a lot of um, test containers, which again have been classified as IO generators, customized applications, and complaints. 
containers. So IO containers is going to be about um, load gen containers. So whenever uh, we are doing the ETV, we are going to deploy applications and run some load. So, so this load can be generated either uh, in a synthetic manner using some uh, load generator uh, tools like IO meter, SysBench, FIO, VD bench, etc. That is one way of doing it. Another way is to actually deploy the applications and run application specific workloads. So we have a lot of application specific workloads like uh, um, CPCC workloads, Yahoo benchmark, uh, SysBench workloads customized for MongoDB, basically create MongoDB uh, direct databases and uh, tables, etc. So this is going to this folder is going to contain the uh, workload generators which are specific to application. So there is a general consensus about workloads, the term workloads. Some of them refer to any application running on Kubernetes as a workload. So um, we sort of kept this particular uh, folder as generic, and we created uh, an IO folder inside to specify that this is load gen. So in our context, as a storage community, for us, workload is more about what is the nature of the IO, what, what are the um, uh, block sizes we are going to use, what are the extents we are going to use, etc. So IO is going to be one of the workloads or the workload containers. And we are using some applications inside the workload folder. So this is catering to the Kubernetes definition of workload, where it is application running on the Kubernetes itself. So here we have some uh, applications which we are customizing. So the Percona and MySQL official containers have been um, uh, instrumented a bit uh, for different purposes. Uh, that is, the first, in the first case, it's being instrumented for some monitoring. In the second case, we are uh, specifying or classifying a MySQL container as MySQL master and MySQL slave, etc. So these kind of customized applications are going to be found in this particular directory. The third one is uh, compliance. So there are sometimes some compliance checks we may have to run against our application container. In our case, uh, storage container. So it could be security, it could be compliance for a particular storage protocol, etc. So they are also workloads in a way. So those containers will be placed here. Just going back, uh, let me do a tree. Uh, for better visualization. So workloads consists of um, application workloads, load generators, and some complaints workloads. And of course, we can add to this list. This is how we are looking at an initial uh, uh, structure. So each of these workloads is going to contain a readme, which is describing the um, uh, intent of that particular uh, test container or the workload container and an example about how they can be used. The example is either going to be a, a set of commands, which is directly going to invoke this container, or it could be a Kubernetes specification, a pod or a job or a deployment, which is going to make use of this container and its run characteristics. So that is how the structure is going to be uh, created for the workloads. So Litmus, um, as we told, is going to be part workloads and the part tests. I forgot to mention about the third category. It's about utils also that are going to be um, helpful in a test, which can be classified as a test by itself or either as a workload. So utils is another uh, folder that we've kept here. So this is going to be some tools that you're going to use as part of the E2E. Uh, E2E, like Amit mentioned, is uh, uh, not also software, it is software. It is a piece of software which requires all the conditioning and uh, all the um, um, essentials that you would generally associate with any functional software. For example, we need logging utils, we need uh, um, uh, unit test utils, we need um, um, some tools that you're going to use as part of the E2E. For example, chaos utils. So all these utils are going to be placed in the utils folder. Currently, it has uh, three directories. We have a logger container. 
it's just going to uh, talk about uh, it doesn't have anything right now so it is going to consist of a container which will help us collect logs for the ATE duration it is going to contain a readme which is talking about how the logger can be deployed and how it can be configured etc the next one is about the um, uh, unit test util so the ETE is going to be written um, in different uh, languages. Let us say, uh, basically, um, uh, um, Amit talked about uh, how you can uh, write English-based sentences and convert that into Golang uh, uh, modules. So this also needs some kind of unit test to be done. So the client, the KTS client here is basically going to have some test containers which will uh, emulate the client Go. And it will also contain some other uh, uh, test containers which can sort of lint, verify our uh, existing uh, Go tests and uh, any other kind of tests that we write. So the OpenEPS E2E, which we will move to in a short while, which is also part of Litmus, has tests written in Ansible. So Probably this uh, utils folder can also contain some tools which will verify or unit test the playbooks itself. Um, so basically, this section is going to contain to sum it up. This section is going to contain um, some tools which are going to test the test scripts themselves. So that is the intent of uh, KTS client. The next one is chaos. So the resiliency tests and chaos engineering uh, related uh, tests are going to use certain open source. Chaos tools like Chaos Cube, Pumba, Powerful Seal, Chaos Toolkit, etc., and some which we are going to write ourselves as part of the Chaos uh, Test Initiative. Let us say some disk failure injections, etc., are going to be containerized and placed here. Um, so, Util folder is going to contain these kind of tools, which are not the tests themselves, nor are they exactly workloads, but something that is going to um, help us run these tests or help verify certain functionality. Okay, so this is about the non-test part of Litmus. Let me go into what the tests will actually contain. So do we have any questions uh, uh, up till this point? So we spoke about the this portion of the Litmus till now the utils and uh, the workloads. Okay, uh, let me proceed. So the other part is going to be the tests and um, they're all classified or they're all placed under a to e folder. So this again has been subdivided into um, two parts. Um, for lack of a better term right now, we have called um, the framework that um, Amit and uh, the team are coming up with as four. So this is basically going to have the uh, code that is necessary to actually help us write those English language like this. So the traditional host structure, PKG, vendor, etc., is going to be placed here. The examples is actually the place where we will have scenarios defined. So MySQL deploy success, deploy failure, resiliency checks, etc., are the scenarios this, which we um, are expecting end users to come and create. Um, so each of these is going to contain Each of these is going to contain a readme file which is specifying the test intent or what the use case is going to achieve. And then it is going to have a dot feature file which is going to be something like the slide that Amit showed. Let me open um, Amit's working repo. Is going to look something like this. So there's going to be overall feature definition, and there are going to be multiple scenarios in each feature. So this is going to be contained 
in the e2e dot feature and e2e underscore test dot go is the <coughs> resulting go uh, test that is going to be derived from this uh, particular feature file and that is going to be initially created with a set of subs which is then going to be um, auto updated with the test logic so this is actually something that is being uh, created now this is in progress so these uh, functions are going to be mapped to those uh, statements and uh, what we will have is uh, a fully functional test file which is not only going to be um, uh, created but we will also have a, a container that is going to run this test as well so those details will actually be present here so the expectation is most of the users are going to be interested in uh, creating generic test cases so they will come look at the examples and create their own folders with the scenario so this is about core the other part of the automated test is the e2e suites that are being actually um, run by um, teams like open ebs uh, kubernetes um, etc they are the actually e2e suites which are going to consume the test container that is going to get generated out of uh, the framework which amit showed the core or it's a pre existing test which is using the workload container which we described about uh, just before some time back for example the provider could be open ebs or it could be local pv so each of these has their own e2e test which has been uh, organized in a specific manner in open ebs we are using ansible at this point in time so this is going to contain the structure which is native to that particular storage storage project local pv might have its own structure which may not use ansible but may use something else probably go and may be structured in a different way the open eb is ansible is basically structured uh, in a particular manner with the inventory plugins roles playbooks etc so i will not uh, detail what exactly goes into the roles or plugin or inventory but i'll probably give a glimpse of how the playbooks themselves or the tests themselves are going to look like for example um, we structured the tests as uh, complaints test isq the um, feature test um, resiliency test stability test etc and each of this will have the uh, sub categorization for example we might do isq the complaints we might do complaints for some other aspects which will add here some of the current features could be provisioning snapshot volume policies etc and the volume policies could consist of no definities stain tolerations etc and each of these uh we, you, if you can see this uh, suffix that we have created here alongside each of the uh, actual uh, category names so this is basically to um help us create a test you can see here that a test is going to be named in a particular way it is going to contain uh, uh, it is going to basically tell us uh, what exactly it is going to do and where it has been positioned in the open ebs repo or uh, the uh, it litmus repo basically so this is going to contain this particular test is actually going to consume the containers from the workloads uh, workload container or it could uh, consume containers that amit uh, got off framework is going to create so this is the overall uh, structure um, we we don't have the similar structure created for the local pv which but we might uh, do that in a short while so this is how we are actually planning to structure the litmus repo so just to, to reiterate it is going to contain uh, workloads and utils and tests the tests again are going to be the uh, godog based test then the actual provider based test provider based test currently use uh, uh, or currently contain open ebs and local pv and we can add to these in the future um 
yeah any thoughts feedback about this uh, repository structure uh, i think i have some uh, uh, thoughts around it um, yeah. but i'm you know I, i probably need a little bit more time to uh, articulate them um uh, but just a you know a quick uh, gist of what i'm thinking is uh, let's go to the parent folder okay yeah. okay i think uh, this structure uh, looks good uh, maybe like you know as you are explaining that um, you know uh, we basically have facilitators and uh, actual workloads uh, i was wondering if utils should be named as facilitators itself um, because utils tends to get overused in repositories and then we won't be able to know which one is for what um, so if you go into the utils right um, it's uh, mostly about uh, logging uh, chaos engineering um, or maybe like some other tools so either utils can be renamed as facilitators or tools depending on what okay. the right uh, now going back um, there seems to be some kind of a overlap between the workloads and the e2e itself um, okay for example e2e mm -hmm. i would um, have uh, thought will only contain the tests right um, I, i'm not, i'm not sure how to you know should the godoc thing come here uh, which probably makes sense right um, Uh, or we could do this uh, uh, um in the e2e we can have just the providers and uh, people who are consuming the utils and uh, the godog and the core itself uh, core is the name we are using for the godog framework core itself can be a, 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 a first level directory that is it can come outside the e2e okay and it can be created right in the it is a user who wants to uh, create some test scenarios and um, he is basically uh, <coughs> trying to create a generic test case he is not really interested in uh, how open ebs or local pb or others are achieving it if he just wants to be able to try something out quickly then probably it's uh, going to be helpful to have that available to him immediately after he enters let me rather than going to some sub directories and find out from there exactly i think yeah having less number of uh, uh, sub directories is always good um one I, i still want to hear amit's thoughts on how he wants to structure the godoc repo for example like um, you know the vendor pack vendor and vendor folder for that golang related test that should also probably be at the uh, top level itself of litmus yeah uh that's right so uh i what, what i think is uh, the core may not be uh, when we can say that it is a core but we need to give a folder structure uh, to core is what i was thinking um uh, so so the root folder will have all the things there's a pkg vendor and all and um uh, we have to give some uh, good names where we uh use those uh, uh, scenarios um uh good name is uh, some folder where uh, it will have scenarios as well as uh, some test files it's underscore test.go along with that it will have files like uh, docker file uh, and uh, some of the file that needs to be applied by kubectl uh, some of the yaml files uh, it might also have some files uh, to launch uh, that um, scenario as a container for example scaffold files which will uh, launch a scenario as a job in the cluster um, <clears throat> so um, 
so so each of these uh, like test case will uh, have a folder with the appropriate name inside the folder there will be all this kind of files uh, dot feature file docker file scaffold file or the yaml file and underscore test dot go file yeah so um directly under the litmus we will have let's say we call it as test for obvious reasons okay instead of calling it as a core mm-hmm. and uh, a test can further be categorized based on the workload type um, and um, the workload let's say mysql right uh, uh, just trying it out um, so litmus test mysql uh, and then under the mysql you can have uh, different uh, use cases of mysql um, and each of those use case will have this scaffolding files right yeah um, along with the feature and a docker uh, file as well and a container might be created already for that particular feature and then yep. um, so that the instructions will give us the way to just run that particular scenario right right uh, the given environment and uh, e2e i think should still contain that um, uh, ansible as one way to run the e2e yeah. maybe like in the future we will find some other way to run the e2e um, and um, within the e2e ansible they will probably make use of these uh, containers that we generate under the test right okay uh, kartik i think uh, uh, still uh, this is uh looking at this initial structure is giving a lot of ideas on how or like how to structure um uh, so maybe like we can brainstorm a little bit more on the slack on um, how to um modify this and then put that in a document share it and then start making this change sure agran uh, so just to summarize um so we are saying that the um let us is going to contain the test folder which, which is where we plan to actually have the godog based test and uh, there we are going to categorize these tests based on the workload correct okay sure can probably i will just make that modification and i will just share it so we can discuss further correct and sometimes for example some tests may be there where godog may not be handy but like say compliance test right um it's uh, we, that, that's a compliance test need not be written in godog there's already maybe like a well known way of doing it um, but that test also will be there and its corresponding docker file will be there uh, in that folder okay so i will be retaining the provider uh, concept yes yes so under e2e is where uh, we need uh, uh the provider concept and also we need to bring in like say ansible and all to the parent level itself so e to e immediately should say um whether it is being run using an ansible ci right um ansible uh, is ansible being used to kind of orchestrate the entire e to e that's one thing um okay and provider also the provider part is good i, I think we'll retain it and uh what can happen is the ansible may use some scripts under the provider open abs to do some specific open abs tasks or some specific uh, uh, local pv or like any of the storage related tasks okay okay uh any other thoughts i'm i'm good from my side thanks for this uh, session very useful yeah. thanks kartik uh, uh i guess uh, we are done uh, with the session and um, uh, yeah. any other questions we can post on the slack uh thanks everyone for your participation uh we are good to uh, end the meeting now thank you, thank you.